The Croton River. For generations, its distinct timeless energy has shaped the structures of many lives. Like a mirror, it reflects the hopes and dreams that challenged the hearts of man. As time went on, people dedicated their lives to capture the energy and power the river possessed. These people, their ambitions and achievements are the spirit of the Croton. The new Croton Dam took 12 years to build. It was the second dam New York City would erect within a half of a century. It is the second highest hand hewn masonry structure in the world, the largest being the pyramids. The dam is 301 feet high, but only 175 feet is above ground. It is 216 feet wide at its base and would require 909,000 cubic yards of masonry. It required the efforts of 57 engineers and more than 6,000 workmen from Italy. Angelo Benedetti is 100 years old. He is one of the thousands who worked on the dam and contributed to the growth and spirit of the Croton. During the 1700s, the Croton River ran through more than 360 square miles of the Croton Valley. Although it is 33 miles north of New York City, it was selected to be the best water supply in the region. The city needed a larger volume of water than the river had to offer, so in 1841 the first Croton Dam was completed. This made the river swell into a reservoir. However, New York City was rapidly growing as the Industrial Revolution was going at full force. To meet the growing demand for water, it was necessary to look for a more ample water supply. Again, the city looked to the Croton Valley. Another dam was built three and a half miles downstream of the first dam. It was completed on December 15, 1906, and called the new Croton Dam. This not only made the reservoir longer, but nearly doubled its volume. In the 1700s, the Croton River served as a vital trade route serving New York City because it ran into the Hudson River. Along the banks of the river were mansions owned by well-known families such as the Van Cortlands. The Van Cortlands were a very rich and influential family. In the late 1600s, they purchased 1,500 acres from the Indians. They later accumulated over 87,000 acres, nearly all of Westchester County. The Van Cortlands were very prominent during the Revolutionary War. They had a choice location at the mouth of the Croton River, a public boarding house, a successful sawmill, and were well known to travelers on the Hudson. The Van Cortland Manor was a very convenient place for these travelers to stop at. Besides being by the Croton River, the mansion was next to the main road that went through Croton Valley. Since the Croton River was a very powerful and swift running river, it was necessary to use a ferry to get across. And what you would do would be to ring the bell to call the ferry master from the ferry house. He'd come out and pull you across the river um, to the other side so that you could either have something to eat and some place to stay here at the ferry house or to take you on the other side of the river to, to continue you know, your journey. The Van Cortland Manor supplied lodging, food, and other services for the travelers along the river. It was common for most of the travelers to obtain supplies before completing their trip to New York. Farmers and millers, such as the Underhill family and Bailey families, used the water to transport their goods from upriver. In addition to the Croton River, there was a route called the Turnpike that ran to the north. The Turnpike was mainly used by farmers and millers who transported their goods to the Croton River. In the 1700s, the turnpike crossed over Pines Bridge. Peter Price, historian. Uh, it followed approximately the route of uh, the line of Route 100. Uh, freight and farm produce, cattle were driven down it to Ossining, Sing Sing, as it then was, and uh, was shipped by water. And the famous uh, famous Bailey elephant supposedly came up that route. 
The first Pines Bridge was built about 250 years ago. It was a wooden bridge and was the main artery from the Croton Valley to Brewster. During the Revolutionary War, Washington's troops secured the Pines Bridge area to prevent the British troops from moving northward. In 1849, a new railroad system was introduced and it ran parallel to the turnpike. The railroad proved to be a more practical and faster method for transporting goods and it displaced the turnpike as the main artery to Brewster. The railroad went out of business in the late 1950s, but the train trestle is still intact. The bridges and roads of the Croton Valley took a great deal of manpower to build. They are the symbols of the transforming river into the present reservoir. Each time a new dam was built, the bridges were replaced by longer and higher ones, and many roads had to be moved to elude the rising water. The 1800s brought rapid growth to New York City. Waves of immigrants came to this country searching for a new home. These new immigrants greatly increased the population of the city. This created many problems with the drinking water supply. In the mid-1800s, there was not enough wells to satisfy the growing demand for clean water. The increase in human and animal waste that was seeping into the water table was making Manhattan well water unsafe to drink. The problem got so bad that in 1831, a city council chemist said in a report that you could smell the city three miles away. In 1838, the New York Common Council created a law that gave the city the right to go up into Westchester County and buy land to be used for a city water source. Later that year, John Jervis, a civil engineer, was hired to find land for an aqueduct and a site for a reservoir. Jervis later calculated that 813 acres of land was needed for an adequate water source. Jervis continued his work on the project and began to look for a choice location for a dam and an aqueduct. Jervis chose the site of Garrison's Mill along the Croton as the best site for the dam. The next challenge was building a 32-mile aqueduct from the dam site to the Harlem River in New York. The aqueduct was built of stone masonry and took 10 years to complete. It cost $11.5 million. The dam was 50 feet high and 100 feet across at the top. The dam cost $5 million to complete. The dam and aqueduct were the most technologically advanced at the time they were built. The workers for the dam were all Irish immigrants. They came from Ireland in 1830 because of a potato famine in Ireland and for the higher work wages in America. The 4,000 Irish workers were given 75 cents for a 10-hour day of work in the U.S. as compared to only 10 cents a day in Ireland. The Irish had to face many problems when they arrived. They received a lot of aggression and prejudice from farmers because of the lower wages the Irish agreed to work for. Many farmers were angered when they were forced to sell their homes and land to the city to make room for the new reservoir. These problems were the causes of many fights and riots between the farmers and the dam workers in the late 1830s. In January of 1841, a major tragedy hit the Croton Valley. After an 18-inch snowfall and three days of heavy rains, the reservoir and river became seriously flooded. The water began to rise so high that the farmers and the millers in the area began to worry if the dam was strong enough to hold back so much water. They noticed that the masonry overflow section of the dam was not letting out enough of the water, and the water level was getting higher and dangerously close to the top of the earth embankment, 15 feet above the overflow section of the dam. Workers in Bailey's Mill and other mills downstream of the dam work through the night building walls of sandbags to keep the water from flooding their mills. By 4.30 in the morning, the water rose to three feet over the earth embankment and the dam broke. At that moment, a tremendous roar was heard throughout the Croton Valley. A 50-foot wave of water crashed downstream 
leveling homes, mills, and anything in its way. The most damage was done to Bailey's Mill, where the Bailey Wire Mill, Farmhouse, and two other houses were totally destroyed. The Underhill Mill and the Van Cortland Mills all suffered heavy damage. The water rose so high that it came to within three feet of the Van Cortland Mansion. The force of the dam break and the flood water snapped trees out of the ground and destroyed all the bridges across the river, including Pines Bridge. Tons of silt were deposited at the mouth of the Croton River. This made it impossible for boats to conduct trade up the Croton River. In the end, seven people were killed, and the disaster cost the city $800,000. The dam was quickly rebuilt on a somewhat different design, as I remember. That seems to have been Jervis's one uh, failure. In spite of its downfall in January of 1841, the first dam was completed in June of 1842. At that time, it was the greatest dam and aqueduct ever built. The population of New York City was booming in the mid-1800s. The per capita consumption for city residents nearly doubled from 38 gallons per day to 78 gallons. This was due to the invention of flush toilets and other water closet and kitchen facilities. Although the city was receiving water from the Bronx and Harlem rivers, in addition to the Croton watershed, it was not sufficient for the growing demands of the city's rising population. The Croton region was growing just as fast as the city. New farms and summer homes are being built constantly. In a survey by New York City Board of Health in 1885, it revealed to the City Water Commission that over 12,000 livestock and more than 120,000 people living along the Croton were contaminating the reservoir. The city tried to solve its problem by evicting lifelong residents from their property in the region. The people fought the city in the courts, but the Webster Act, adopted in 1893, gave the city the power to evict landowners from their property within 300 feet of the water. It wasn't long before the city would extend the banks of the reservoir even further. In 1886, New York suffered one of the worst droughts ever. It was during this time the city realized that a severe drought could devastate the city. Again, the city fixed their eyes on the Croton Valley to increase the volume of the reservoir. Grover Cleveland, governor of New York in 1893, signed a bill which would allow New York City to build a high masonry dam and aqueduct. The city hired Benjamin Church as chief engineer, and along with several other prominent engineers, they planned out the design of the new dam. After a great deal of research and analysis of the geography of the Croton Valley, they developed plans for the construction of the dam. The results of the study proved to be a dam that was the tallest hand-new masonry dam in the world. The engineers knew they were about to create the greatest dam ever built. In 1892, construction on the new dam began. There were many problems that made planning the new dam very difficult. Since the new dam would double the size of the reservoir, engineers calculated that over 7,000 acres were going to be filled in with water once the reservoir was completely filled. Over 400 farms, 21 houses, plus schools, churches, and a few mills had to be abandoned to make room for the rising water. Over 32 miles of roads had to be demolished and rebuilt. The city spent nearly a million dollars to replace 13 bridges that crossed the Croton Reservoir. 24 miles of railroad tracks from the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad had to be replaced, costing the city nearly $500,000. Even six cemeteries had to be relocated. 1,500 bodies had to be moved to different cemeteries along with their tombstones. Josephine D'Alvia, author of The History of the New Croton Dam. They moved bodies from the cemeteries for $23 a body and seven or three, between three and seven dollars a stone, and they moved them to the various cemeteries in the county. The hardest part of the operation was getting the people to move their homes and sell their property. Even though notices were posted, the people of the Croton Valley put up a good fight. In one case, 
45 students who were studying to be priests at St. Joseph's College armed themselves and said they would fight for their lives if the engineers tore down the college. Many landowners who refused to leave their homes took the county to court. In some cases, these court proceedings were so complicated that it took nearly 10 years to be resolved. The most dramatic change was the necessity to move four complete villages. The towns of Katona, Armonk, Golden's Bridge and Purdy's Station had to be relocated on higher ground. In the town of Katona, most of the landowners decided the best thing to do would be to physically move their homes to higher ground. They would take houses with clothes on the porch, on the clothesline, and babies in their cribs. When it came time to move, everybody moved. The houses were lifted onto a series of railroad ties and wheels. They were moved over miles of hilly terrain and finally placed in a new location. After the people had moved off their property, the land had to be cleared to prevent the earth from getting contaminated. Every building was burned or moved, and every tree had to be cut down and carried away. All of this took over 10 years to complete. Another problem was obtaining over 1,500 workers. The engineers calculated that they needed 500 stonemasons to work on the dam and 400 others to work on the rock quarries. In the early 1890s, the city hired hundreds of Italians from southern Italy. Unlike the old Irish workers, these Italians were professional stonemasons. But these men had uh, worked on all the cathedrals and churches and big buildings that we have in Italy today that are so beautiful. They were expert stonemasons. So they came here to work on this dam and they lived within the periphery of the dam. When the Italians arrived in America, they expected to see the streets paved in gold, but instead they saw this, New York City. Most of the immigrants were no more than 20 years old. When they walked off the boat, they were greeted by their employees and were brought up to the Croton site by train. Once they reached the Croton, most of them were put up in private boarding houses. Others had to do the best they could, living in small wooden shacks. If a worker had a family, he probably would have built his home on the hill next to the dam, known as Larkin Town. By the time the workers were getting settled in their new homes, the dam was already under construction. In 1892, the Irish workers in the area began to start the excavations and construction on the base of the dam. The engineers planned on building the dam in three sections. The first section was a 600-foot-long central masonry dam, which was to be built across the lowest part of the valley. They also planned an 18-foot-wide road that was to be built along the top of the dam with a steel bridge to go over the spillway. In addition to the dam, a small bridge going over the base of the dam was planned, along with a park owned by the county. Next, a temporary diverting dam and canal were built to keep the water from flooding the construction site by carefully blasting a pit 130 feet into the ground. The next step was building a series of small earth dams held together by a core of wood, cement, and stone. After it was completed, the canal was a thousand feet long and two hundred feet wide. It was expected to last at least eight years and was built as strong as many permanent structures. The Aqueduct Commission also said it was necessary to replace the old Croton Aqueduct and build a newer one at a different location. They said that the aqueduct was becoming too costly to fix and was deteriorating at a fast pace. The new aqueduct was designed to be larger, stronger, and more efficient. But just how efficient is the aqueduct now? Statistics show that more water flows through the aqueduct in one day than ran through the Croton River in one whole year in the 1700s. Another major phase of the building process was cutting stone used in the dam. This is the Crompon Road Quarry in Cortland. This is where all the granite for the dam was obtained. The huge blocks of granite were pulled from the base of the quarry by three inch thick cables. They were placed in a steam engine locomotive, shaped, and transported to the dam. The locomotives and trolleys that carried the stones ran on a series of portable tracks. 
Since it was impractical to construct a continuous line of track through the hills, the workers would pick up the tracks from behind the train and move them to the front of the train. They did this until they reached the dam site. The stone was sometimes over 10 feet tall and weighed over 2 tons. Most of the rock was blasted out of the mountain with dynamite and then cut into rectangular shaped blocks. Once the stones reached the base of the dam, they were mixed with cement and carefully placed in the correct position. Placing the masonry in the dam continued six days a week and 24 hours a day. In the evening, the work areas were covered with heavy tarpaulins to keep in the heat. A machine shop was provided at the base of the dam. The shop included an electric light plant which provided light for workers on the night shift. On extremely cold nights, the cold rocks were heated with steam and the cement was mixed with salt to keep the cement from freezing before it hardened. In order to make it possible to transport materials from one side of the dam to the other, the contractors built a hole that was large enough for the trains to fit through. This hole was later filled in and a staircase was built directly above the hole. One of the biggest events during the construction of the dam was the strike in 1900. The workers went on strike because they demanded a 25 cent increase in pay plus shorter working hours. In 1897, a state law was passed stating that people working on public projects could work no more than eight hours per day. The workers told the state they were going to have a hard time if they didn't receive an increase in pay. When the contractors refused to give in to the workers' demands, the problems began. On April Fool's Day in 1900, the workers showed up on the job but put down their hammers and went on a full-scale strike. Strike leader Angelo Rotella and a large number of striking workers hid up in the hills and threatened to harm the workers if they did not participate in the strike. As the days went on, the strikers got increasingly violent. After a few bloody incidents, Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders came in to restore peace. Shortly after, the workers received their demands for shorter hours and an increase in pay, and the strike ended. In 1901, a masonry inspector informed the Aqueduct Commission and the chief engineer that the dam was defective. He said that the earthen core of the dam was not strong enough. Expert stonemasons were called together, and after months of deliberations, they agreed to tear down the earth core and replace it with watertight masonry. Two years later, another problem held back the construction. The chief engineer notified the Aqueduct Commission that the south end of the dam was in danger because it was situated on top of soft limestone. The problem was quickly solved when the soft rock was removed and masonry was replaced in these faulty areas. The life of the workers was mainly very simple. They lived in two towns, Larkintown and the Bowery. Larkintown was located on the hills overlooking the dam. On the hills of the dam, uh, as you see to the right of the dam, to the south of the dam, which would be in that area, lived uh, the Italian stone masons that were married, and they had 52 houses up there on the three hills. And these people would come down to work every morning down into this area. They bought their food from either the town of Croton or from various stores near the base of the dam such as Dominic's Meat Market. The other town where the workers lived was called the Bowery. At the Bowery, they had 23 houses, which included 12 saloons and an assortment of other stores, such as a bakery, a post office, and a funeral home. Most of these workers were unmarried Italians, and if they lived in the public boarding houses, they paid 10 cents a day for room and board. That included food and clean sheets. The workers ate mostly pasta and beans for dinner that were either cooked outside or on the pot-bellied stove in their house. Goat's milk, eggs, and beef were brought from nearby farms in Croton and Yorktown. The work was very hard during the day, so they liked to have fun when they weren't working. The Italians loved to celebrate their cultural festivals and holidays. In the village itself, they had uh, bicycling, bicycle races. Here they had tobogganing down the hills of the dam. 
and they would have races between the uh, uh, coaches, you know, the little carriages, and uh, uh, horseback riders and so on. One of these Italian workers was Angelo Benedetti. He came over to America in the early 1900s and worked on the dam until it was completed. He recently celebrated his 100th birthday. He is believed to be the only person alive today who has worked on the new Croton Dam. For his birthday, he received cards from students in a local primary school and a congratulatory letter from President Reagan. We visited him and his family. He shared with us some of his experiences while he was working on the dam. He was 22 years old when he started to work on the dam. I work every day, I work hard too. The work wasn't only hard, but dangerous. They had to carefully move stones up and down the dam site. Mr. Benedetti was able to avoid injury, unlike hundreds of fellow workers who were seriously injured. Some even died. He remembers one man that was killed on the project. His name was uh, uh, Mariano Ferrenti. The days were long and hard, but the men looked forward to the 20th day of every month. It was payday. Buy beer and some drink, for then sing the sing song, play and dance. They celebrated paydays with festivities of music and dance and lots of spirits. Mr. Benedetti used to play the accordion. He used to play with friends who play guitars and other accordions as well. As time went on, the fun and hard work paid off. In 1906, the new Croton Dam was completed. The project took 15 years to complete at a cost of $15 million. For over 78 years, the 2,400-foot dam has satisfied the thirst of New Yorkers, and today, the dam and reservoir are still considered one of the best sources of water in the world. Each day, 10 million people rely on Croton water. Over the years, billions of gallons have been consumed by city residents. Even though the beauty of the dam and reservoir will never change, New ways to utilize the greatest potential of the reservoir are being studied. Carl Pica, watershed engineer, explains. At Gatehouse 2, which is at the spillway end of the dam, we're going to remove the uh, valves and uh, sluice gates that are in there and rehabilitate those. And also on the drawing boards is a proposal to put a hydroelectric plant in at that location. Well, besides the dam, we're talking about a new gatehouse at Croton Lake. The existing gatehouse went in service when the dam was built and uh, needs heavy rehabilitation. And uh, what we're talking about doing is putting the new gatehouse right out in the reservoir itself so we can maintain the old one in service while the uh, new one is being built. The first step in building a new gatehouse is to drill borings into the solid rock beneath the water to look for a suitable location. The plans for a new gatehouse are very complicated and it will take several years before the actual construction can begin. But on the whole, Pika says that the reservoir is as healthy as it's ever been. Wildlife on the reservoir is flourishing, and he says that the reservoir is full of a wide variety of fish. Periodically, over the course of the year, the Department of Conservation stocks the reservoir with different types of fish. Special fishing permits are available for the reservoir free of charge for Westchester County residents. As time goes on, the endless tranquility of the water remains. Under every stone, beneath every tree, the dreams of a lifetime have left their memories for eternity. Even though the seasons change and day turns to night, the spirit of the Croton will never fade away. <laughs>